This day's been a long time coming, but it's here. And what's gonna happen is, Kevin Eckerman is stopping by to help me. Actually, I'm going to help him install the rotary three-phase converter that I've had sitting out in the corner of the shop now for quite a while, waiting for the right moment, because this table saw is just about to come to life. Oh, this is uh, my dad's new table saw here. Two 16-inch blades. It's got two big blades and it weighs a ton, so I'm trying to get it in place. Thank goodness for these Burke bars, but it's still gonna be a wrestling match getting this thing off the pallet. So I put in a smaller rotary three-phase generator to power my radial drill, I don't know, probably 11 years ago. And I did most of that work myself. But this Oliver bench saw takes a lot more power than that system can send. And I have plans for more tool additions in this shop. So one more time, I have to retreat to the standard position that too much is always enough. Well, I think I just made it. Kevin's gonna be here in about five minutes. And I think I've got access figured out to sneak power from over there, over here. When I put this floor in, now I guess probably 12 years ago, I sort of had the impulse to think about being able to do things like this later. So the plywood, 3 eighths, that stapled down over the form lumber that I had on hand that I didn't need, that I put in over four by six pressure treated joists is only lightly stapled, which means these strips came right up and they will go right back. And this time I will staple them down like I mean it because I don't intend to have to run power under this floor again anytime soon. So you guys have seen Kevin before. We've had him on our podcast. He's been, he was at the spec house. He, I've, I've worked with Kevin for a long time and he comes out and he gets me out of trouble here in my own shop all the time and today it's this non-typical three-phase rotary conversion process using a rotary three-phase converter that I bought used. We think it's going to work but he's having to do a little bit of uh, forensic work to figure out what was done here before and what needs to be done here today. So Kevin, how are you feeling about the likelihood of success here today? Pretty positive. See that's why I use him. He's always pretty <laughs> positive. <laughs> 95% sure it'll go far. All right, so somebody did some sort of a Frankenstein thing in there before, but we've got that comprehended. And So anyhow, I'm just gonna let the camera run and give him a taste of working with a security guard looking over his shoulder. It does wipe the zen out of the shop, but he can handle it. So here we go. By the end of the day or the end of the week or the end of the month, we're gonna have three-phase power on this end of the shop. Now maybe you've run into the overwhelming number of details and options that are always in play with electrical installations. The questions that bear on keeping the electrons moving around safely and effectively in our homes and shops are daunting to say the least, at least they are to me. Add to that the need to comply with electrical codes to satisfy inspectors and it makes electrical work the Rubik's Cube of construction. I've found over the years that the best contribution that I can make to a project like this is usually to drill a few holes, take care of the demolition, and drive back and forth to the parts store just to keep things moving along. Uh, while you're gone, I went ahead and laid out where we're going to put our inch and a half nipple through from the sub panel to feed our phase converter panel. And went ahead and landed the wires for the phase converter itself here and now we're going to get that nipple in and get the feeder into this panel and repair some wires that were cut by someone before you got it that's our uh, third phase that someone for some reason had cut the wire so we'll get that repaired and get some wires landed and we should be done out here once we get the feeder in and we can work on the 
supplying the disconnect. So under the broad general category of real good luck, this old saw had a cord coming out of it and Kevin relocated in order to squeeze out a little more length and now we're coming right out we're dropping down into the floor and the holes that I butchered and he's got that's is that just the right amount or is that just the right amount I think it's we're gonna make it work we're gonna make it work it's close to just the right amount and if we have to we'll slide that saw, saw over six or ten inches and get the length we need well in this situation where Scott needs three-phase power to run his equipment and only has single phase power feeding the property. We came across the, this phase converter, which now they can use variable frequency drives and other means to do the same thing, but nothing wrong with this. Just a little dated, but it'll do the job. So we're just gonna, with the single phase power, which we're gonna hook up coming in and, and supplying this, this via the capacitors and these wonderful parts down here will generate that third leg, which is the T3 over here, to give us that three-phase power. And we will come off with our load once we have that generated third leg. We'll come off and supply that three-phase sub-panel next to this whole thing. This is bigger than we need for that one piece of equipment, but looking ahead, Scott usually does. It'll allow him to not only supply the machine we're talking about, but also any future pieces of equipment in his shop here that require th three phase, uh, 230 volt power. And I think it's a win win situation. So, get it done, we'll fire it up. Tell me about that wire, Kevin. What size is it and why has it got to be that big? It's number two THHN copper. And part of the NAC wire chart for a 100 amp circuit. For Say that again. What, what wire chart? Look at us and tell us what is that even? What is an NH? What's the, the wire NEC, chart? NAC, National Electrical Code. Okay. And so the, it specifies? Uh, wire size for certain ampacities. Okay. And, for, uh, and there's different temperature columns for different applications, which we won't right. get into that, but number two THHN in this application is rated for the, the 100 amps we're looking to get. Plenty of power for 100 amps, which will be more than enough for a five horse motor. That's the sound of 20 foot pounds of torque right there. <laughs> <laughs> and that designates what exactly? Neutral conductor. Neutral so conductor. Gra grounded conductor. Marked in white. So Kevin, there's all kinds of stuff here. I don't know if those are Christmas ornaments or if that's a chemistry set or what's going on here, but you've been working on it and it looks good and you had me do some items, but help the people understand what you're working on, what you have accomplished and, and what we have yet to do to make this code compliant. All right. Well, you needed, with your existing power to the site, you have 120, 240 volt single phase fed off your main panel. You needed that third leg for your three-phase equipment. You have your three-phase converter and with some instruction, it looks like you did well. Uh, I helped you out on some points here and there's a few things we need to do before we're all done to meet code. There's a, a knockout in the back of your panel here. You need to put a KO seal in. Knockout here that needs to be sealed. And I will you could build something to su support around this wire. Um, or to cover the wire for, to protect it from physical damage. So the single phase power comes into your panel here, supplies power through the capacitors for your three phase converter for startup. 
because of the, the voltage that has to be created to start this thing up. You'd be draining your parent, your neighbor's lights. So this <coughs> converter makes this third leg, which is right here, C phase. It's a high leg, which is noted with the orange. What that means is you have 120 volt to ground on each of the A and B phase, which is your single phase power. That third leg that was generated is 240 volt to ground. It's called a high leg. And for running your equipment, it's fine. But if you had lights coming off this panel or other 120 volt loads, and you had it on this C phase here, turn on, it would smoke it because it's 240 volt instead of 120 volt to ground. It was Cy Swan that first introduced me to rotary three phase conversion. And as you might expect in his shop, the setup is elemental and effective and more than a little bit scary. So I'm going to take a chance on showing my ignorance and presumption here. But as I remember the way Cy explained this to me, when a motor is forced to spin, rather than spinning to produce power or horsepower, it generates inside its field something called eddy currents. And the eddy currents can be used to generate the third leg of power that Kevin is talking about. Now, I don't know anything about this, but I do know that in old-fashioned or shop-built examples of this, the third leg is so out of balance that sensitive equipment like CNC um, machine tools or computers, certainly, don't like it, can't use it, and it can cost you a lot of money if you hook them up to something like this. To solve the problem of sensitive equipment and three-phase power, a lot of people use something called a variable frequency drive, which is just some sort of a magic box that attaches to the wall and the wires go in and the wires come out and the equipment runs. That's how much I know about that whole process. But I'm always thankful to have somebody like Kevin around to bail me out. So I would like to tell you that when I push the button here in about 15 seconds, it's the first time that I've run this thing since it came out here from the East Coast, but it's not. We tested this about 10 minutes ago and the polarity, what I call it polarity, or the, the legs were reversed. Yeah. yeah, with the three phase power, if you get two of the legs, which two legs need to be? It's a rotation. Yeah, uh, the rotation was backwards on this, on this unit. So we switched to A and C phase, which reverses the rotation on this shot. So now it's running straight ahead. It is terrifying to hear the power and the momentum in this 16 inch blade. And that, my friends, is a cable saw. So if there's a lesson here, it's this. Your friends magnify your capacity. Kevin knows so many things about electrical and equipment and that sort of thing that I don't know. And he is generous with his knowledge. He lets me go as far as I can, and then he comes over and, you know, we have to retrofit a little bit of what I did, and he takes me a little further, and he leaves with instructions, and then by the time he's down the driveway, I've forgotten what he told me, but I can always call him. He's a good friend. I've known him for a long time, and this is just the latest installment in the ongoing saga of Kevin keeping Wadsworth out of trouble. So I don't know if you could hear that. I mean, over the roar of the saw and the whine of the, of the inverter, converter, three phase rotary converter, which by the way, is a resounding success. The saw's got all the power that it needs and it's got all the power that I need, I can tell you that. But as we were coming out of the cut, you see that knot right there, that Douglas fir knot? Well, there came a moment when the pressure of that saw cutting that overpowered whatever was holding that loose knot in and it came out and it banged off the inside of my arm and it flew across the shop. And it's just a little reminder that a table saw will hurt you. And this, my friends, is not a saw stop. And so every time I walk up to this thing or anyone else walks up to it, it's time to be on guard. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.